Okay, let's go ahead and we'll get going again. We will return to the rendering of all this stuff and actually see the effect of putting in all these like different types of objects like lighting. And it all started with this notion of really choosing the right rendering quality settings everywhere from draft to best and choosing the right resolution. And the big issue here in the whole workflow was start small, start modest, see if you can get the answers you need, and only after you get more locked in, then increase the rendering quality because it's going to take so much more time to render it. And it's just painful to sit there and watch it render. Okay. In terms of working with the different objects and the settings, one of the critical ones we're really going to pay attention to today is the whole notion of the lighting, both in terms of the outside and the inside. And as we go through and look at the sun settings, we played around a little bit with the idea of kind of setting a specific place and time and location that was relative to Palo Alto so we get accurate sun as well as manually putting it in there. Okay. But we were still basically looking at it as sort of a single fixed point in time. We were saying it was at 2 o'clock in the afternoon or was at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I, as a brief diversion, want to show you the notion of how you do a solar study, okay, which is really about the idea that the sun actually continues to move around in the sky. So rather than just looking at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, you might actually like to know what's happening with the sun and the shadows throughout the day. because. You know, we can all choose that one moment of the day when it gives you just exactly the lighting effect you want, but it's really not a very fair representation of what's going on. You really like to know what's going on from 8 a.m. up to 6 p.m. so you really understand what's happening. Or even throughout the year, because it turns out the sun and where it is in the sky is very different in December where it's very low in the sky to, Jan or to June when it's very high in the sky. So you'd like to actually sort of understand those things. And let me show you where you get to that information back in our model. So here we are. Let's go back to, I'm going to go to an exterior view so we can do this. Zoom out, zoom out. I'll just zoom on in and we'll take a look. Okay, so here's the issue. We got our model hanging around. There aren't any shadows showing right now. It turns out the whole issue of shadows is actually independent of rendering. Shadows and the amount of light being cast by the shadows can be happening within a rendered view, but doesn't have to. You can even sort of show shadows in just any view. So in this 3D view, I can actually come on down and just say, turn on the shadows. It's one of the graphic display options. Okay, and it'll shade that view okay, based on the current settings for where the sun is. Okay, so based on these settings and where the shadows are casting, I'm betting we're still somewhere we're probably in the oh, morning to noonish sort of time because the shadows, what north is back over here, it still looks like the sun's over on the east side of the project. Okay. If I want to go ahead and take a look at that, what I can do is look at the graphic display options and say, oops, no, it's just sunlight from top right. Well, that's not what we want to do at all. Let me choose a specific place in time like San Jose in the early afternoon. Oh, let me make it 1021. Okay, let's pop that out again. It's up here in sun position. It's this little dot, dot, dot right there. And that gives you the sun positions. And this is for a single still point in time. We could change the uh, location to someplace else. We could change the time to someplace else. Again, to change the location, let me move it out of San Jose. I'll move it into Palo Alto. It'll be ever so slightly different, but it is a little bit different. Okay. What's going to do is do some recalculating in there. So these are my shadows at 1245. Okay. And if I like those and they're looking pretty good, I can go back and say, okay, well, what would the shadows be like at, oh, you know, 245? And come on out here, and I can change them. It'll do a little recalculating, and oh, we get a little more sun on the building this way. You'll still see the long shadows from the trees kind of heading to the back. And we can say, okay, well, what's it going to look like at 445? And when I say okay, again, it'll recalculate the shadows. Notice that when you calculate shadows, it takes a lot longer to render things or to sh even shade things. Okay, and the shadows look a little bit different. 
So just a note about shadows. Leave shadows on when you need to see what the effect of the shadows is. When you don't need to see, turn them off. It's actually controlled on a view-by-view -view basis, but it slows things down quite a bit. So if you're really slow, turn off the shadows. Or even if you need to sort of keep them on in one view, make a duplicate of the view where you can turn them off, where you can do your work really quickly, and then you can turn them back on again, or go to the other view to see them, the effect of the shadows. So use views creatively to make sure you're not just always waiting on things to happen. Okay. Now, this whole thing, 9 in the morning, save it, 10 in the morning, save it, 11 in the morning, save it. Yeah, that's going to get old really, really quickly. So to combat that, we actually have a tool available. If I go back to those graphic display options, you'll see that not only can I do a single still point in time, okay, I could do single day or multi-day. Single day being for a specific date. Okay, give me a time range from sunrise to sunset, computed every hour. Yeah, I can sort of set just really exactly what I want it to be. Let me go through and say that, oh, it's going to be 10, 21, 2010. Looks a lot better for sunrise. I'm not sure why sunrise was at 3 a.m. before. Okay, we can do something every hour. That's probably sufficient. Let's talk about that. You know, if you really need a very fine level of control, you can bring that up to every 15 minutes or every five minutes, every thir 30 minutes, 45 minutes. Once an hour is probably okay. Okay enough to understand what you're trying to get out of this. Okay. Notice this other issue about the ground plane. Let me talk about that. Since my site actually has a lot of surface, it has some ground underneath it, we're doing okay. Some things we don't have that, so you actually need to turn on the ground plane because what the ground plane does is it gives you a surface to catch the shadows. If you just have something that's floating in space and there's no ground underneath it, you won't see the shadows because they sort of go through to infinity. Okay, so that's what that's all about. But let me go ahead and I've changed these settings. Actually, let me duplicate this and call it a one day study fall in Palo Alto. Beautiful. And I can say, okay. And I'll say, OK. Let's take a look at the effect of this now. Doesn't look too different yet. But if I come under here now, instead of actually going through and saying, just turn on the shadows, it's turn on or off the solar study. And at this point, I can do one of two things. I can make a study and save it as a movie file to play. Or if I just want to preview it and kind of check out how it looks, I can say preview the study. And let me show you what it looks like up here. Here we are at 527. It's the 11th frame, it's the last frame. I can go back a frame, back a frame. And as I back up hour by hour, it's going to continue to change up here in the option bar. It's going to show me slightly earlier times, 227. Can you see the shadows moving? So that's just kind of a shortcut. Go ahead and use that just to kind of understand what's going on with your shadows. This is really very useful as you do your design because it's not very helpful to understand really the effect of the sun and it's having on our buildings. You know, there are times when we actually want to get sun through the windows because we're trying to capture the solar radiation and heat things up, and we'd like to go ahead and capture that as passive solar energy. There are times when we don't necessarily want to see the sun. For example, in doing this little solar study, I can tell you that in the late afternoon, okay, there is going to be a lot of blazing sun coming through some eight foot by eight foot windows on the west side of the building. Okay. That's going to be a very uncomfortable place to work. Okay, so what's going to happen is, what has traditionally happened, no one paid attention to that. Someone has to immediately go out and get some Venetian blinds, cover it all up, put some sort of solar film. You've got to do something because it's going to be so hot, no one will even want to work in there. Okay, since we caught this now as a designer, we might be able to do something like put a light shelf in there or some louvers or some shades that will let us do a couple things. We can block the direct sun. We can also reflect the sun so it goes up to the ceiling and sort of helps illuminate the inside of the building and save some energy. So the idea is really that with these sun studies, you can go ahead and 
capture that so that you don't have to wait till the building happens and then fix the mistakes. You can actually start building in your design features. Maybe I just need to sort of even think about those windows and change the positioning of them so that it really isn't giving me so much sun. So there's a lot of things I can do since I have this information now. Now, if I want to save this away and share it with someone else, what I can do is actually export. And I can export an animation of the solar study. And if I do that, it's going to say, oh, what is it? I can just choose how big the movie is going to be. I'll make it a little smaller. I can choose how many frames per second. There's only 11 frames, so I'm going to slow it down. Be a 10 second movie. I can choose whether I want to do the shaded view or whether I want to do a rendered view. Okay, Easy enough for me to choose one or the other. It's going to be no more work, but shading will go a lot faster. If I <coughs> render it, it's going to render one image, then move the frame, render the next image, move the frame. So it'll take a lot longer. So I'm just going to go ahead and shade it for now. Because actually for what I'm doing, it'll help me understand well enough just by shading it. Okay. When I'm presenting this to the client, I'll probably go through and render this so they can actually sort of see exactly what's going on here. Let me let that be, and I'll let that go. It's doing its thing, and really what it's going to do is just march through one frame at a time and kind of keep on recalculating. The little progress indicators, oh, it's a little bit deceptive because it's actually showing you the progress on each frame. That's why it kind of keeps on jumping back from 18, 19% and then keeps on going back a little bit. Okay, I can see I'm about halfway through right now. Actually, you can sort of see even here, I'm on frame 8 of 11, 9 of 11, 10, and finally, the last one. Beautiful. Where has it put that? I just actually saved it out to my, uh, where did I put it? I just put it out there in documents, my documents. Go out there to, oh, where's documents? There it is. Here's my little solar study movie so you can see it. So you can start to go ahead and save those things and really understand what the effect is. Now, what I want to do next is actually to show you a little preview of a feature that's available in Revit 2011. Okay, this That whole idea of doing a solar study is so powerful and so popular that they actually made a very quicky way of doing solar studies there, even quicker than what we've seen in the past. And this is going to look an awful lot like Revit 2010, because it is. Really, Revit 2011 took a few very specific features and increased the functionality, really sort of optimized and customized some things. And one thing was the integration with the whole solar studies. So in this version, let me kind of zoom on in there again. Actually, not too far. There, in addition to being the shadows on and off, right next to it, there's this notion of a sun path. So I can look at the sun settings again. And rather than being these lighting settings, that's the whole idea of a fixed point of light at a single position. Let me go back to single day. I'll go ahead and, oh, I'll duplicate this. I'm going to say solar study Palo Alto fall. I can again define Palo Alto. This should look pretty familiar to you. There's Palo Alto. Okay, we'll go back to uh, 10, 21 again. Sunrise, sunset. Okay, beautiful. But in addition to that, we now have this thing where we can say to show the sun path. And let's show you what that looks like. Let me zoom out. Okay, This is, um, I'm struggling to figure out the exact word for this thing. It's not a heliodon, but it's something like that. 
Okay. But what this is doing is basically, let me zoom on out a little further. It's showing me basically the sun in the sky at different times. And I can drag the sun in the sky to oh, later in the day. Let me kind of zoom in a little bit closer so you can sort of see what I'm up to. So as I go dragging the sun in the sky, let's try pushing it back the other way. Well, let me just, I'll, instead of dragging it, I'll just change the time there. Let's say 9 a.m. Oh, do I have to turn the shadows on? I think I have to turn the shadows on to make this effect the <laughs> demonstration effective. Okay. So, there we go. Sun. As I go moving the sun in the sky back to an earlier time, the shadows change. If I move the sun in the sky to later in the day, okay, the shadows are changing. So I can go ahead and sort of put in specific times, and the shadows will keep on changing. I don't want to go any further. Okay, <laughs> and see the effect of changing the shadows. I can also check out the effect of changing the date. So at 12, okay, we're much lower in the sky in December. If I move to June, you'll see the sun is much higher in the sky. And if I sort of hold down on the sun, you'll see that whole yellow band is the total range from the highest to the lowest where it's going to be in the sun at different times of the year. Okay, so this is all just about giving you another way to kind of quickly test different things. So if you really want to know what it's going to look like during the equinox or at different times of the day or whatever it is, you can sort of just real quickly pop around. Yeah, to save that, no worries. You can still save it and export it just the way we did before. But that's just sort of a quickie method of kind of just testing a whole lot of things very quickly so you can sort of see, you know, am I getting the right behavior in the summer? Am I getting the right behavior in the winter? Okay, let me go ahead, I'll shrink that back up again, because I want to go back to the old 2010 version, and instead of just looking at the sun in the sky in the outside world, I want to start thinking about the sun and really what it's doing for us on the inside. Oh, I'm going to show you this in terms of the background image file in just a second. Let me go ahead and skip past it for now. Instead, even for the rendering exposure settings, I'm going to show you that on the interior, so that'll make a lot more sense there. I'll even save these. So I'm going to go ahead and get you going to challenging lighting situations. Here's where I want to focus your attention. There's really a couple of lighting situations that are classically hard to render, and it usually involves just very uneven lighting. The big one being that you have a lot of light coming in from the outside, you have some light on the inside, and the light on the outside is so, so bright, you can't even sort of make out the small range of difference on the inside. Okay. So in that case, it typically happens when we have windows in the background of the view. We need to sort of adjust the rendering settings. We can add some lamps. But really, even before we add the lamps, we can usually do most of what we need to do by just adjusting the rendering settings. Okay. And then we can start worrying about lamps. Another class case is this whole nighttime renderings, where there's really no sunlight on the outside. We're going to have to adjust everything so it's completely done with lamps. Okay, and we'll show you both of those because they're really kind of both kind of classically fun ones to deal with, and they have their own sort of little caveats to them. Okay, let's start with the lighting on the interior and really just needing to choose a lighting scheme, either interior or exterior. This one's all critical. You need to know about that. If you're going to be inside, switch it to inside, interior, as opposed to exterior. you got to do that to just sort of even get yourself in the right ballpark. Then you get to choose which light sources to include, the sun, artificial lights, or both. And whenever you can, try to go through and just do things with a sunlight, because it's much quicker to go through and compute it that way. Let me show you how this actually works, because we'll do that to a view, and then I'm going to go back and really sort of just play with the rendering quality settings to try and maximize the amount of light I get out of the sunlight. So what I'm going to do is, in my view, I'm going to go to this interior. It's called Towards the Lobby and Stairs. There we go. Now, this is kind of a classically hard to render view because I got the stairs that I want to see, but I also have that big plate glass window in the background. Okay. So let's start with just some very basic, let me just render this and show you what happens. I'm going to say just render it at kind of a low quality because I want to sort of get something out quickly. Interior, sun only. I'll start there. 
Let me just render this, and we'll let it rip. Okay, and then we'll go back and see if we can sort of do a little bit better. Now, as it's rendering, I want to draw your attention to, up here in the progress bar at the top, there's this whole idea of the artificial lights, the number of artificial lights being considered in the daylight portals. So let's talk about what those are all about. Okay, sunlight is one big source of light. Okay, and as it's going through and doing its calculations, it goes through and calculates for every source of light in the model, really, what the impact is, how much light you're actually bringing to every surface. And that's really how it does its rendering. So sun is not too bad. Sun is one source of light. That's one thing to consider as light bounces off the walls and ultimately gets to its source. Okay. As we go through and start considering all the artificial lights, each of those has to be calculated too. So one artificial light, more work. Two artificial lights, a whole lot more work. Three artificial lights, this is getting tough. Four, five, it starts really slowing things down because there's a lot more calculation that has to go on. So that's why I say if you can stick with the sun as a starting point, that's easy because it's only one light to consider and it's much quicker. Okay, We can turn on those other things, but it may or may not make a huge difference. So here we got, this is a view with a window in the background there. Okay. It's kind of dark in the foreground. It's not exactly what I want it to be up front here. It's a little kind of bright back over here in the corner, but there is light there. There is light coming through, and that's a starting point. So two things I want you to do on your interior renderings as you go through. One is, before you make any other changes in re-render, we're going to go to adjusting the exposure, and we're going to see if we can pull light out of the image just by changing the range of what it's looking at. And let me show you what I mean. If I say adjust the exposure, we have this whole lighter, darker thing. So for free, it's really not going to take any more processing time. I can darken up an image. Okay. Well, that's for making it very dark in the foreground, or I can brighten up the image. Okay. And don't go too hog wild with this. If you go very far, you get those really whited out images. If that ever happens, just reset to default and see if you can sort of bring it up again, but just be a little more modest with what you're trying to do. <coughs> so try and bring up the image. What I'm trying to do is get a little more light here in the foreground. Okay, the stairs aren't looking too bad. One thing that is looking bad, though, is this area right back here. Okay, that's what I'd call too hot. It's just really too bright right now. You can't see anything. It's like just a very bright direct light out there. If I want to tone that down a little bit, I can darken up the highlights. I'll apply that, nah, even further still. And what I'm doing is, I'm not sort of decreasing the overall brightness very much, but I'm really just saying at the top end of the range, go ahead and clip that off so it's not quite so aggressive there. Ah, now that's a little bit better. What I like about this level right now is I can actually sort of see the shadows from the mullions. It doesn't just look like a flash bulb went off in my eyes. Okay, so. This is a little bit better, but it's still not as good as it can be. But you know, as a low quality rendering that I didn't do very much to, it's not too bad. I actually got some light out of something that I didn't think had very much light in it. Okay, What I am going to do is say OK to that. And just so I can have it around, I'm going to save it to the project. What this is going to do is make that rendered image just part of the project. Let me go ahead and save that out there. I'll call it stairs, test one. Low. And by saving it, what's happening is actually it's going to show up in the project browser now. If I go on down, you'll actually find the renderings. And it's kind of hanging around out there. So I can go back and grab that later. So that snapshot's been saved. I like to keep some snapshots around because sometimes as I keep on going, you know, sometimes I make things worse. And I'd like to have the snapshot around so I can go on back there if the deadline is getting close. It's always nice to have something in your back pocket just in case. We'll keep on trying to improve, but we'll keep it around. OK, so here's the principle I want to sort of drive home about this interior lighting and the sunlight. Let me go back over here again. OK, there's this notion of light bouncing. Okay. And what happens is, for every different settings, every different set of quality settings, you get to determine how many times light bounces. Okay. At low quality, light only bounces a couple times. It bounces like two times. And you really want it to bounce a little further to fill out the light. Let me talk about how that applies in here. 
For example, you look at these lights up here on the ceiling, the light actually doesn't come down on you very directly. It sort of bounces up on that white ceiling. Okay, and then if you're here in the middle of the room, it's bouncing down on you, so it might catch you on the second bounce. But there's actually more light, because there's light that bounces off the ceiling and bounces onto this wall and then bounces on down to you. And there's some light that's coming through, it's bouncing up off the wall, down to the floor. The floor is reflecting some up and it's hitting the ceiling again and that light's bouncing down on you. So the number of bounces has the effect of sort of filling out the light. The fewer the bounces, sort of the harsher the edges, because you only sort of consider you know, the first order of effect of the lighting. But if you let it bounce around some more, by the time it all bounces, you know, we don't have that real harsh line. You have all these relatively smooth lines around the edge where the brights and the darks, they taper out very gradually. And that's what we want to play around with because that's actually something that can be incredibly useful for getting light into a view that has otherwise is having a hard time getting that light. Let me show you where you find that. Okay, I got my low quality, that's okay. But let me go ahead and say, edit the quality settings. Because you know low quality is OK, but you go rolling on down, you'll see there's this indirect illumination bounces. It's set to 2 right now. And that's just not enough to really get the filling that I'm looking for. So how do I make that available? What I'm actually going to do is just copy some settings to custom. I'm actually going to copy even the medium ones and copy them to custom. When I say copy to custom, it actually says, OK, well, you're going to customize, and that's fine. That's going to let you change the individual values from the presets for medium. And what I really want to do is turn up this guy, indirect illumination bounces, because that's the one, and I've played around with this a lot to try and get the most out of it. Yeah, That's the one that gives me the most bang for my rendering minute. OK, so go ahead and think about doing that. Okay. I'll start that rendering just so we can see what the difference is. I'm going to point out this other part here, daylight portal options. I'm going to leave those turned off for now. But as it's rendering, I'll explain what they're good for. Say OK. Let me start this rendering. Nothing else up my sleeve. I'm not changing anything else. Let me just do the rendering. And we'll let it get going. OK, so still one source of light. OK, so relatively about the same amount of computation, although we're going to bounce it more time, so it will take a little bit longer than the past one, but it's still just one source of light. Okay, There's no artificial lights or daylight portals. Again, when I start including the artificial lights, like those uh, ceiling lights and the troffers and those, that'll make things go a lot slower. Daylight portals is the notion that if we really want to consider each of those different window panes to be a source of light, not just the light coming through, but we want to sort of really kind of consider each of those. It can, but if we turn them on, you're going to see that you know, all of a sudden it jumps up to be 100 different daylight portals that have to be considered, which really, you know, just it's exponential what it's doing to your time in terms of computing. That's why I leave it off to the very last what minute. Would you, do that? You, you really do it, if it's, if, especially in a very low light situation. It will give you a more precise, softer rendering. What is it? This is actually accuracy versus precision. What we're doing now is going to get you in the right ballpark, plus or minus 1 or 2%. Yeah. That'll actually get you down to that last 0.005%, but yeah, this will at least get you close enough. Okay. Because to, the, the, the cost to me of turning on that last bit of precision may be another three or four hours of rendering time. Okay. And you know, overnight at work, you might have that, but you know, between now and your next midterm, you don't have that. <laughs> so uh, that's why I generally leave that thing turned off. OK, so we're going to let this thing go ahead and fill on in. In general, the effect we're going to see is that by bouncing that sunlight off of more surfaces, it's going to hit that white wall on the side. It'll bounce into the room, and then it'll continue to bounce and fill out the space. So let's let it finish doing its thing, and we'll take a look at the result and kind of compare it. Oh, so slow. We should actually like keep stats on uh, the actual amount of time computed for each of these different things. But actually, let me just comment on this. Y even as you're doing your renderings, you know, notice that uh, no, about halfway through, I'm still at like two minutes or something like that. That's kind of acceptable. You know, if it's taking five minutes for a rendering, you can live with that. 
If you've somehow adjusted your settings so that now you're up to taking 30 minutes or 40 minutes or something like that, you know, slow down, stop, come see one of the TAs or see me, and we'll actually like kind of figure out what we can do to get you some light without having to wait an hour long for each rendering. Because it's really, you know, just ratcheting everything up, you know, doesn't necessarily get you more light. In fact, let me talk about that. Yeah, you know, in general, turning the quality up doesn't necessarily buy you that much more light. Doing this number of bounces changes more light, gets you more light. But just turning the quality all the way up to high, well, it'll help, but there's going to be a lot of other things going on that are going to take a lot of time. So, you know, high quality isn't always the easiest way to get there. Or there's a more refined way to get there that won't get you such a big hit. Now, compared to the last image, this is actually pretty bright. I can already see there's a whole lot more. My carpet actually looks blue as opposed to navy blue. I can actually see the light reflecting off the sheet rock. You might also notice that over here, the, the, the shadows are actually pretty soft. I don't actually see a really harsh edge where the sunlight's stopping and the lighter colors are starting. It's a little harsh over here still. That would go away if I kind of keep on turning up the rendering a little bit. But you know, the quality of this is not too bad. I'd say, you know, this is pretty fair. If you're getting renderings that look like this, I'd say you've accomplished your mission. You're looking pretty good. You can still go through and adjust the exposure. I might want to, oh, I'm a little worried about how hot it is right in that corner, but it doesn't look like I really have much room to take it down. Maybe I'll bring it a little bit darker. But that's pretty close to where I want to be. OK, so if I save that to the project, I'll call it stairs test two. This is more bounces. Spelled wrong, but that's okay. Yes, which guy? Actually, they weren't. I, you correctly noticed that actually the exposure settings worked back to the default. It had kept the exposure settings from the last time. Yeah, so good catch, because that actually, uh, I noticed that. I was going to slough through it, but you caught me. Because now it really it used the, the improved exposure already. Okay, so here's my first one at low quality. Here's my more bounces. So, you know, that definitely bought us a lot. Yeah, Cody, what you got? Okay, what you do to get there is we go back over to the 3D view. Where'd it go? There it is. Interior, towards the stairs, towards the office, towards lobby and stairs. There it is. I'll turn on rendering. And up here in the quality settings, I'll say edit. Oh. And it's at that time when you do the copy to custom. That's when it opens it up so that you can change that number of bounces. Great, thank you. No worries. OK, let's go ahead. I'm going to switch to a different view. I'm going to switch to a view that's just those lights, those daylight, so we, or those uh, artificial lights, so we can then really see what the effect of doing that is. Because that's where you want to end up in terms of, uh, or you may need to end up. Yeah, for your rendering. What I'm going to do is go to that, oh, interior towards the offices. So this is that one I put all those little lights into. Okay, To help us really see the effect of these lights, what I'm going to actually do is just turn off the sunlight. Okay, As though we're doing a nighttime rendering. Because it's going to be very subtle to see the effect of those lights relative to the light coming in the window. Let me just try it without it. So I'll say render. I'm going to say, you know, interior, but just with the artificial lights only. That'll just cut out the sun. I could also do that just by changing the time of day to like 8 or 9 at night, something like that when it's there. But this will work for us. Artificial only. Let me at start this out at low. So again, we can sort of just get something quick to sort of see how we're doing. And it'll start its calculations. Now, I haven't done anything to the lights, so right now it's going to have all the lights turned on 100%. Okay, And because of that, you're noticing artificial lights in the progress dialog says 16. Okay, So it's going to have to actually consider the light from all those different sources. Not too awfully bad. The nice thing is, since the light is relatively dim compared to the sun, it doesn't bounce all that far. Okay, you'll see, okay, it's not pitch black. That's a good sign. We are getting something there. You can
can sort of see the hot spots where the lights are. Let's let that finish up. Okay, again, at low quality, it's going to go through and just do two passes, I think. It won't necessarily be the best quality, but it'll actually give us some sense of really are our lights turned on and what's the overall brightness. And then we're going to start playing around with the exposure settings to sort of try and maximize the light that's in there. Yeah, Cody, what you got? When you say our We'll show you that in a second. By default, when you bring them in, they are just turned on. Okay, yeah. so I got my lights turned on. Let's see what's going on there. You can sort of see here's my torchier light. I got these little sort of sconcy lights. I got that desk lamp back in the corner or the table lamp. I got these oh, pendant lights at the top and finally the troffers. Even the teeny tiny little like uh, down light there. They got a lot of things going on there. So just some things to note about my rendering here. Notice that the window, that big black old piece of glass reflecting the outside, just looks like a big mirror. Okay, so what it's actually doing is reflecting back the lights that you're seeing inside. And if you've ever sat in front of a big old plate glass window at night, that's how it is. It's like a big old mirror. A cold mirror, but it's a big old mirror. Okay, now that view still looks a little bit dark, so let me try adjusting the exposure to it. See if I can pull some more light out without actually doing anything else. I can maybe try brightening it up a little bit. Ooh, that actually brightened it up pretty far. Maybe darken it back a little bit. Okay, Maybe if those hot spots, the hottest spots are looking just a little bit too hot, I could bring them down. And yeah, that's actually not too bad. A lot of people would say, well, that's pretty close in terms of what's going on. There actually is enough light going on in there. so. That's not going to be our issue. We're doing OK in terms of the total amount of light. We don't need to put more lights. We just need to kind of control them a little bit better. So let's talk about that. How do you control your lights? Well, each of those different lights is set to its value at 100% right now. And if you would like to turn some lights down or turn <coughs> some lights off, I'll go back to the kind of model view. And I can choose a light. <coughs> and I can say that little wall light over there, if I go to artificial lights, you'll see a listing of all the different lights in the building. Okay, So we have the sconce lights, the pendant lights, the down lights, the floor lights, all those sort of things are available in there. Let me show you a trick about those lights, because you're looking at all those lights and great, but you know, how do I know which one's which? Okay. Here's what you got to do. Every light actually shows this thing called its mark. Its mark is its unique identifier. I can choose that light. Take a look at its instance properties, and you'll see it has a mark. So if I want that to be B1, and this one over here to be B2, just because in my coding scheme, that'll help me find them. Kay. When I go back into rendering, and say, let's look at the lights. It'll actually show up as B1 and B2. OK, so that's going to be your little clue about what you're looking at. Now, to turn off a light completely, let's say I just decided, you know, that torch here just really wasn't doing a whole lot for me. I can just turn it off just like that. OK, cut it off. Okay, All these other ones, I can start adjusting. Oh, yeah, just really I can control their dimness individually. So for the sconce lights, if I want them to be about half as opposed to full level, I could put 0.5 in there. Okay. Oh, what else can I do? Actually, I didn't even notice that. If you go clicking on the light, you can sort of see which one it is right there. That's actually not too bad. It's going to blue it out. Okay. Another thing you might want to do is, you know, at this level, it's not so bad to turn them all off individually, but. If I need to go ahead, and or it's sometimes helpful to group lights together just so we can sort of uh, control a bunch of them at the same time. So example, I could create a group called, oh, the office troffers. And then maybe take this one and take that one and just move it into that group. That way I can sort of turn them on and off as a group, or I can dim them as a group, whatever I want to do. That's just sort of a matter of making it easier for you. 
Well, let's say OK to those. Let me go through, oh, remember that trick about bouncing lights? It's going to work here, too. So I could say copy to custom, do the bounces, kind of soften out, fill the total amount of lights, and I can go through and render that. Let's get that going. Okay. And we'll sort of see what the effect is of turning on some lights, turning off some lights, and bouncing them more. Okay. But always do those things, see how it renders, then go through and again adjust the exposure. Really see if you can pull out the part that you want. Okay. Because that gets you very, very far. And that's really the key to doing these renderings with the interior renderings. If you can sort of get that issue of the lighting and the exposure right, you're going to do okay in terms of what you need to. Yes, Farzam. Oh, no. You're <laughs> Ah, we're almost out. What's that? Let that run. So as this is running, let's see if we have any sort of questions in terms of the assignment about what you have to do. So again, the assignment is you're supposed to come up with some exterior rendering, okay, just one. Okay, You can sort of choose what it is. If you want to do more, that's fine, but you know, Make sure you get at least one in there. It could be of your vacation house or something else if you prefer to render some other project. Okay. You're also supposed to come up with an interior, oh, from the exterior rendering, it could be a daytime rendering, it could be a nighttime rendering. Some of the very nicest architectural renderings are one where you're looking at a building and it's night outside and you just have the lights inside and you sort of see just the lights glistening through the windows. Those are all very pretty. So think about that. You could even, even putting lights on the inside of the building, you could put lights on the outside of the house, and especially if you have like a rock surface or something with a little interesting texture or some fantastic overhang, you put some lighting underneath there and it really makes it prominent and stuff like that. So use lighting as one of your design variables. It's really kind of a very cool thing that helps you create the effect you want to affect. Great. For the interior rendering, the big thing is go ahead and get yourself some nice view. It'll help you. If you think about the view, not to go ahead and, for example, put Cynthia or one of the people on the couch right in front of a huge plate glass window. Because that plate glass window is hard to control, unless you're going to go into 2011 and put a nice view out there. Okay, But you're almost better off going and facing inward somewhat. It's nice to get the effect of the light coming through the plate glass window, but it's just hard to render in front of big windows. You know, so. Or if you do put Cynthia in front of the big plate glass window, you may have to go ahead and just really work with the exposure settings to make sure you can see her face in front of all that other stuff. So, yeah, consider that. Okay, this is actually, I did this one at low. Okay, just with some of the lights on. This one, it's not casting any light. It just happens to sort of continue to glow like it's white. Let me see what's going on here now. I can adjust the exposure. And now I can go ahead and try to, again, sort of bring up the brightness. A oh, little too bright there. OK, and now I can play games with the highlights again. Let's take a look at that. That's actually sort of a good color thing. It's this whole thing. Intense gives you very saturated colors, and gray gives us sort of very paled out colors. And this is actually something even Charles was talking about the other day for some of the people in his class, that maybe sort of just grayed out images might be even better than very colorful images, just depending upon like uh, the effect you're trying to achieve. So. It's all just a game of you're creating the right, you know, the impression you want it to have. So depending on how you want that thing to read. It's interesting. What's happening here, I should comment on that a little bit because the bouncing light is going around. Notice how this image looks very orangey. You have an, you have an idea of why it sort of looks this orangey color as opposed to very white? Actually, it's, it's, it's not strictly that, because you can't put a color in the light. That actually helps. And you know, fluorescent lights actually are, tend to be very bluey white versus incandescent lights, which are a little whiter or yellowier. But 
What's happening here, it's most of the light's actually reflecting off these wood surfaces. Okay, and that's one of the things that happens to light is it reflects off surfaces. It actually picks up the colors, the spectrum of the color. There's a color in the, in the wall, and it reflects off just parts of that color, which is why it's kind of weird. If, you ever, if you're ever hanging around at the same time, try this one day, hang around in the blue atrium and see if you can get a sense of how the light feels, then go over to the yellow atrium. And it just feels very different, and it really is just that the light itself is picking up the orange color or the blue color, and that reads cool, and that reads warm, something like that. And red reads entirely different. OK, so what's that? Well, change that. <laughs> OK, so go ahead and play with these lights. Control the lights. Don't go too crazy. But I think that, again, see if you can get something that, you know, if this was your rendering for the interior, you know, I'm saying A-OK. -okay. You're looking just fine in terms of what we wanted to accomplish. Because the difference now between, as I turn that up to medium or high, you know, the ceiling's going to render better. This over here is going to render a little more finely. It's not going to be so jaggy. But the issue of the color, your composition, your materials, that's not really going to change. It's just going to keep on looking better. OK, so do that later towards the end. Yeah, for some. Would it help us with the shadow of the window and what you see in the window if you turn it back? Oh, in terms of back here? Yeah, like more detail. Yes, more detail. it actually will. Because right now you're only reflecting this. If, you, if we do this some more, you'll actually start getting a real mirror image. Yes, because actually even part of that is the number of reflections. So you can start to have windows or mirrors that reflect back to a mirror over here, that reflect back to over here. It really, no, it gets to be quite elaborate about really what's considered as different surfaces reflect off of glass. Let's go ahead, and I'm going to adjourn with that stuff, but let me give you just a little bit about the walkthrough part of the assignment, just so we can get you enough to get going for the weekend, and then we'll continue with that next time. And here's the idea behind walkthroughs. Let me kind of just sort of motivate what you got going on. The idea with the walkthrough is you have these cameras. You've been placing these steel cameras. You're getting very good about placing cameras and clipping and what you're looking at. That's no problem. The idea with a walkthrough is you're going to take me on a path, and you're going to do that really by placing cameras at different locations on that path. And as you this is the idea, I want to create a walkthrough. And what I'm going to do in my little building is I'm going to start out here somewhere. I'm going to start outside the front door. I'm going to come through the front door, kind of pause to reflect at Mabel working at her desk. And I'm going to swing over here, and then kind of take a look at the stairways. OK? So that's the idea. I'm going to have some little path. And I want you to have a little path. You don't need to have a cinematic masterpiece. If you can sort of get me through 30 seconds, I'll believe you that you can do the rest. OK, so here's what it looks like. Under the View tab, you'll find this guy, 3D View. And underneath there, oh, the neglected cousin walkthrough <laughs> is hanging down there. We'll take cancel out of that for now. Here's how a walkthrough works. With a walkthrough, we decide that it's going to be perspective. We'll leave it at that. We have a scale, an offset off of the <coughs> first floor. So five foot six, again, that's that eye level. Okay, We can change this. We can raise things up and down. In fact, we can use that to even walk up and down the stairs. But we'll save that for next time. For now, let me just get the basic walkthrough in there. And I'm going to start outside here. That's going to be my first keyframe. And as I go moving on in, maybe I'll pause kind of right near the door, because that's sort of a key spot. And then I have to come on through. And that path that you're looking at, that's actually the path that the camera is going to dolly on. It's going to follow that path. I'm going to get over here to Mabel. I'm going to come on over here. And I'm going <coughs> to go through and finish up, oh, somewhere in here. So I've placed five key frames, and then it's going to go through and in between those. Okay, Let me say finish my walkthrough. Let's take a look. I could either do it here and say edit walkthrough, but what I'm going to suggest doing is scroll on down, and you'll find walkthroughs in the list. Open the walkthrough view, and then we'll choose that and say edit it. So what we're looking at right now is we're looking at the very end of the walkthrough. Let me go back to the very beginning. I'll go back a frame. I'll go back a frame, back a frame, keyframes. Or I can just type one in there. That would have been the easier thing. So here's what you got to do. 
I got my view. My view is kind of hanging out here. This camera, it's kind of OK, but it's not exactly what I had in mind. What I can do is use my little navigation steering wheel. And maybe I'll just look over there and get a little bit closer to the door. That's what I want to see in the first view. Yeah? Yes? What you got to do if it's missing is go to, I think it's under user interface. Go to this thing, I think it's called navigation bar. Okay? And then you should be able to see some little pull down over there. That got it? Beauty. Okay. That's my first view. Let me go back in. Oh, where am I? Edit the walkthrough again. I want to go to the next path or the next frame. I can say next frame. Not much. To next frame. Next frame. Next frame. Next frame. Okay, and that's not getting me very far. What I really want to do is go to the next key frame. Okay, because the key frame is actually the one that's going to make the difference. All those in-betweens are just in-betweens. So oh, what do I look at in here? In this one, let me go ahead and look. I really prefer, oh, I'm going to sort of, I'm looking at the door right before I go crashing through it. That's what I'm doing there. Next key frame, this is where I'm getting down closer to Mabel. Let's see what's happening in here. There's the off. Oh, there's Mabel. Come on, back over here. I need to put her in still, but you know. You'll forgive me that. Enjoying that lighting I put in there. Next key frame down over here for this one. Maybe look over that way a little bit further. And then finally for the last key frame, or close to the last key frame, uh, I'll leave that one be. Let's how about the final key frame right up here. For this one, maybe I want to be looking over here and even sort of looking up the stairs. Enjoying that fantastic curtain wall window that I paid so much for. OK. I got that. We're looking pretty good. OK, what we're going to do is go on back to frame one again. And you can say, play the walkthrough. And all it's really doing is moving us between all those different points, crashing through the door. You can't. It sort of just sort of depend on its 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 rendering speed. You can in terms of the final movie, okay? Because the final movie we could actually say how many frame seconds per fr between all the frames. Okay, so here we are. Oh, coming around. Didn't get much of Mabel over there. Come around the corner. We're spinning. We're spinning. We're gonna look up the stairs. And finally, we're here. Okay. Now, this view, you know, you can choose whether you want it to be shaded if you want. For that little live preview, I can't render it. When I go through and I save it and export it, then I can choose to render it. Okay. But realize what's going to go on. When I finally go through and make that movie, I'm going to have 300 different frames, each of which has to be rendered. Okay. So that's where it takes so much time. You know, that's why I say, don't render. In fact, I don't even expect you to render for the assignment unless you. If you've got a computer at home and you want to leave it on all night, go ahead and let it happen just so you can sort of see what it looks like. Because it's but it makes a very big file. But that's really the principle of what you want to do. Go ahead and get your five key points in there, kind of navigate around, get the camera moving. When we come on back next time on Tuesday, we'll take a look at the issue of if my path isn't quite right, how do I go ahead and either add more points to it or pull it around so that the curve is doing a little bit more of what I want to. And we'll also show you how you can get a path to actually go up the stairs. Okay, so that'll hopefully be enough to get you started. Go ahead and have fun with it this weekend. Come on back on Tuesday. We'll try to have some time in class so we can sort of guide you through some specific problems you're having. But see if you can get to a first level of that. And we'll resume on Tuesday. Okay, thank you.